Good morning. Happy Sabbath. We are the Paintings. I'm Hercules and this is my wife, Pat. We have the pleasure of welcoming you to the streamed worship service of the Columbia Community Center of Seventh-day Adventists. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Once again, we are so happy that you have joined us this morning. So let us have a great time in the Lord. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you at this hour with hearts full of gratitude and praise for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us this past week. You protected us, you guided us. Lord, we thank you. And so, Lord, as we worship you today in spirit and in truth, it is our prayer that we will sense your presence, that we will feel your nearness. Bless us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We want to welcome you to another live service here at Columbia Community Center in Columbia, Maryland, and we hope and pray that today's service will be a blessing to you. I'm Pastor Gary Wimbish, and it is my pleasure to share with you today's announcements. And if you would like to receive them or be placed on the mailing list, simply go to Columbia Community Center SDA.org slash bulletin. We have just a couple of announcements to share with you, but they are very important. Number one, we want to invite everyone to attend this afternoon's praise and testimony service at 4.30 p.m. here in our parking lot at 9121 Red Branch Road. You won't want to miss this service. It's going to be an opportunity for us to come together in fellowship, see one another, some we have not seen for quite a while. Be sure to bring your chairs or you can sit in your car and roll the windows down. But at 4.30 p.m., we're going to have time to praise the Lord, share testimonies. And then we have some hot beverages and refreshments there where we will be able to come together uh, in true joy and Christian fellowship. So we hope that you will be certain to be with us this afternoon. Also, we want to remind everyone of our agreement and our arrangement as a church family with For My City. This is an organization in the city of Baltimore whereby we are able to receive fresh bread and produce that we distribute uh, to the hundred families or so that we minister to uh, in our food distribution ministry. They operate on volunteerism. And we have a number of our members who go over on Monday mornings, some Thursdays, some on Fridays. They put in a couple of hours helping out there at For My City. They use a DoorDash service, so many times we have to stuff the bags with food. But if you would like to participate in this ministry, be sure to reach Sister Pauline Phillips or Dr. C.C. Lester, and they will have more information for you on that. The last Sabbath of this month, October the 29th, we're having our annual service at Skyline Drive in the mountains. We'll be able to see the fall foliage in full bloom. Uh, be sure to save that date. Be on the lookout for additional information. Again, if you'd like to receive these announcements, be sure to go to ColumbiaCenterSDA.org slash bulletin. Now, before we move into other parts of our service, I just want to let you know our special music today is a throwback to a service that took place in 2016. It features not only our own praise team singers, but a very dear friend of ours, Brother Gary Nelson. Gary was an integral part of our music ministry program. And as you will experience today of the three selections that will be shared before the sermon, you will understand why. I am so grateful that the Lord has given us the promise that those who are resting in him, waiting until they hear his call, they are referred to as the children of the resurrection. So it is our prayer. And we know that if we remain faithful and trust in the Lord, we will see Gary again. But today we're going to enjoy 
the Ministry of Music with Gary and the CCC Praise Team. May God bless you richly today. You all know that here at CCC, we love to give shout outs to people's birthdays. And this week we have two people in particular that we are celebrating. First, we have Donna Newkirk. Donna, happy, happy birthday to you. We hope that you enjoyed your special day and we are thankful that God has spared your life to see a new year of life. We pray God's richest blessings over you in this new year that he will give you the desires of your heart. And secondly, Last but not least, our very own Pastor Wimbish celebrated a birthday this week. Pastor, we are so happy and excited that you got to see another birthday, that God has spared your life as well. And not only are we celebrating your birthday, but we're celebrating you this month of October for Pastor Appreciation Month. We are so thankful that God has called you to lead us, the congregation, in the way that he would have us go. And we are thankful for the way that you teach us. We're thankful for the way that you guide us, the way that you help us to have a more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we just pray God continues to bless you. We pray that God continues to bless your leadership, your ministry, your family, your vision, and that he will also give you the desires of this heart in this new year of life for you. Happy appreciation and happy birthday to you this month of October. Please join us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sabbath morning. We thank you for the blessings of this past week in which you have guided us and protected us. You've even given us a desire to come together to worship at this hour, this Sabbath morning. Father, we praise you for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for your healing power. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege you give us to serve one another. And we thank you, Lord, that we can study your word each day and come to worship you. And even though many of us are still worshiping virtually, there are others who are able to worship in person. And we look forward to that happening very soon at the Columbia Community Center of Seventh-day Adventists. For you have blessed us on this journey, and we know you will see us through. Father, we lift up all of our sick and shut in. We lift up our bereaved, and Lord, we just pray that you'll continue to bless our caregivers. Give them the continued strength and grace they need to care for loved ones. We lift up our pastors, Lord, around the globe. You have given them the awesome responsibility of sharing a word and leading others to you. And we just want to lift them up before you this Sabbath morning. We pray, Lord, that you would bless all of the offices within each church around the globe, Lord, and those who are involved in ministry. For it's through your ministry and through your word that others will learn of you. And after all, Lord, that is what you have commissioned us to do, to share your love with others that they might be attracted to your soon coming kingdom. Lord, we've come to hear a word from you today. And so we ask now that you would anoint our speaker, our pastor, Gary Wimbish, with words from on high. Not only we ask your anointing of him, but we ask that you would anoint our ears and our hearts to receive your word, not only to hear it, Lord, but to be willing to do it. So bless us now as we worship you spirit and in truth in jesus name we pray amen We love you. What a wonder you are. We thank you for our lives. We acknowledge you first before we start anything in this program. Jesus, what a wonder you are. If you know it, just join with us. This is as we do for service, our praise and worship. Everyone, Jesus, what a wonder you are. Oh, Jesus, 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 what a wonder you are. What a wonder you are. 
and we affirm him today. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us this far.
set me free. I am in a way out of no way. Turn my darkness into day. You've been my joy in the time of sorrow. Hope for my tomorrow. Peace in the time of the storm. Strength when I'm weak and worn. I can never repay you for what you've done for me. How you loosen my shackles and you set me free. I am in a way out of no way. Turn my darkness into day. You've been my joy in the time of sorrow. Hope for my tomorrow.
I know your hearts were warmed as we relived that worship experience from the praise team and Gary. May the Lord be praised. Today, the title of our message is The Lessons of Insufficiency, and I will be coming from the Gospel of Mark chapter 6 and verses 30 through 38. But before we begin, as is our custom, I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. So grateful that you have spared our lives this past week and you have been our protector and our provider. And so we come to you in full confidence that we will have exactly what we ask for because of two things. The Holy Spirit is helping us to offer and render this prayer to you according to Romans 8:26. And that Jesus declared that if we pray asking in his name, in the name of Jesus, if it is according to your will, it will be answered. So therefore we are asking for the guidance and the unction of the sweet spirit of instruction that will enlighten and illuminate our minds and our hearts, moving us to conviction and consecration and conversion and commitment. So speak to us now is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. The Lessons of Insufficiency. The Gospel of Mark is the very first of the Synoptic Gospels written in scripture according to history and religious tradition. It is a gospel that focuses on the actions and the activity of Jesus. You won't find some of the recordings that you find in the other synoptic gospels as well as in John, but it is a book of action. In fact, one word that appears repeatedly is the word immediately. Mark wants us to understand that Jesus Christ is the son of God, the son of man, but it was his actions that demonstrated and proved that he was the Messiah, the son of God. This is a very familiar passage, however, in the gospel of Mark chapter six, we find that Jesus has commissioned the disciples and sent them out in twos, two by two. And then he gives them power and authority to preach, to teach, to heal, and to cast out evil spirits. So as they are making their journey, going to the surrounding villages, Jesus is praying for them, I am certain, and as they come into the various cities and to these various localities, they are preaching and healing and casting out evil spirits. And the people are amazed, wondering where in the world did these fishermen, these Galileans receive such dynamic power? There is a revolution that is taking place in these cities and towns. And as they make their way back to Jesus, they are overwhelmed, full of joy because they see the benefit of being in communion with Jesus, having received the teachings that he has provided, but also knowing that the only way that these feats have been accomplished is because Jesus prayed for them to the Father and then they received this power. As they're coming back, they are, they are just overwhelmed with joy and excitement. I can imagine that Peter is clamoring, telling the others to be quiet so that he can be the first with his impetuous self to give the account of what had happened as he preached and as he taught and as he healed in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus is taking this all in. And then he beckons them, you know what? We need to come apart and rest a while. And the reason for that is after the disciples had done all this healing, the people are following them. They are flocking behind them, growing crowds and multitudes of individuals who have been delivered and they have had the joy of the salvation of the kingdom of God being shared by these disciples. They want to see Jesus, the one who has instigated the author and the originator, the initiator of salvation, who gave and bequeathed this power to his disciples. Mark tells us that there were so many people crowding Jesus that it was going to be impossible for him to reconnect with the disciples so that they could 
deprogram and can review the things that went right as well as the things that went wrong. So they get into a boat and a ship and they sail off across the sea because Jesus wants to spend some time with them. You see, he understands after an evangelistic campaign and a crusade, you need to refurbish, you need to refresh, you need to be able to recharge your spiritual batteries. You need to be able to relax and to reflect on what has transpired so you can understand the goodness of God and you can perform a spiritual critique of things you could have done better. But then Jesus wants to really have them open their hearts and their souls and, and they are through these experiences that they have had. So he wants to go to a secluded place. But Mark tells us that the people are so excited. This fire of new light has been lit in their minds and their hearts. And the people are running along the shoreline, watching where the boat is going. In fact, Mark tells us by the time Jesus and the disciples got to the other side of the sea, the people were already there ahead of them. They're coming from the north, from the south, from the east, from all over the surrounding areas. And so when they finally land, the word of God says there was such a large multitude, Jesus looked out upon them and he was moved with compassion. I think this is important to note. Jesus's original plans to spend time with his disciples so that they could deprogram, so that they could be able to talk to him and get their batteries recharged. Jesus places those plans on the sideline because he saw the needs of the people. They needed to have the living word of God preached to them by the word of God. They needed that written word rather revealed to them from the living word, which was Jesus Christ. And so therefore he tells the disciples, we'll have our separate meeting later. Jesus spends all day into the evening, preaching, teaching, healing, giving hope and restoration, explaining the scriptures to them so that they can understand what has been shielded from them from years and centuries of ancient traditions and blind ignorance. It gets to the point where the sun is about to go down and the disciples are understanding that this huge mass of people, and it was a large mass. In fact, the Bible tells us 5,000 men, 5,000. Now this did not include the women, the wives, nor the children. There are some historians and some theologians who feel that a conservative estimate for this crowd that had followed Jesus and the disciples to this remote location was anywhere between 12 and 15,000 people. I want that to sink in. So Jesus has been teaching, preaching, and healing all day long, so much so that he has not had time to take a break for lunch or a repast. He hasn't been able to replenish his own body with nourishment, nor have the people. They've been out in the sun, thirsty, hungry, but you know what? When you have the word of God and you've got Jesus Christ there, the hunger pains evade you. You're not even thinking about it because you're in the presence of the Lord. Well, now as the sun is about to go down, the disciples understand. They say, you know what, Jesus? These people have been here with you all day long. We've had no food whatsoever. You're going to need to send them to bring the benediction, bring an end to this evangelistic crusade and let them go into the villages and the surrounding area so that they will be able to purchase food because they will famish. They are famished and they will grow weary as well as when people get hungry and tired, sometimes they get irritable. And so Jesus tells them to his disciples, you feed them. Talking about the lessons of insufficiency. Jesus says, I want you to feed them. 
The disciples stand back in awe. They're wondering in their minds and they begin to express it according to other accounts in the other gospels. How do you expect us, Jesus, to feed this huge congregation, this multitude, this voluminous crowd of individuals? It would take more money than what we can earn in a whole year to purchase enough for each one just to get a bite. Now, I want you to understand the disciples' thinking. Remember, they have just come off of an evangelistic campaign, each of them along with their partner, where they have experienced the power of God Almighty. The Lord of Heaven's armies has bestowed power, given them authority. They've gone and they have preached and they have tamed the devil. They have healed individuals. They have caused the blind, the lame, the sick, the infirm to regain health. They have seen power come down from heaven upon them and through them because Jesus spoke the word and gave them authority. They didn't have the ability on their own. They were not learned men, had not been to the school of the prophets. They were mere fishermen, didn't even have a grade school education. Many of them hadn't even gone through bar mitzvah, if you please, had never memorized the Torah, but yet here they are preaching the word of God, healing men and women, restoring broken relationships, setting the flame of hope, of salvation in the hearts of men, it would have been impossible for them to do this on their own, by their own strength, under their own accord. Now Jesus is telling them. So, so my question is, when they saw and experienced what Jesus did for them when they were on the missionary journey, why would they think the power of Jesus would be insufficient for them to do exactly what Jesus had commanded? I hope you're hearing me today. Many times when we have experienced the power and the manifestation of Jesus Christ in our lives, when he brings us out of a hard place, when we know that the deliverance came solely from the master, no other way, he has given us proof positive that he is walking with us and holding us and guiding us and directing us and supporting us. And then when we come into another situation or a brand new scenario and we're wondering and scratching our heads, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make it? How quickly we forget our Ebenezer's, how the Lord has led us in the past. And so here we find Jesus confronting the, the disciples. And remember, Judas is in the mix. He's a, he is a part of the posse of Jesus, if you please. So Jesus tells them, I want you to feed them. And they immediately, because of the enormity of the challenge in front of them, 15,000 people and you want us to feed them. We don't even have food to feed the, feed the 12 of us. When the challenge seems improbable and impossible, I want you to remember Gideon. I want you to remember Samson. I want you to remember Lot. Here, the Lord tells them, I need you to see what do you have? So they search around and they discover that they have five loaves of bread and two bony fish, scrawny fish. That's all they have. And they bring it to Jesus. Jesus says, what do you have? I can imagine they're thinking in their minds, they're looking out, Herc, and they, they see 15,000 people. And then they look at their provisions, five small loaves of bread and two fish. And they're thinking, this will never do. I can consume this by myself and I still would be hungry. 
but they give it to the master. He tells them, give me what you have. And Mark, uh, in chapter six, he tells them, uh, I want you, in verse 41 rather, and when, and this is the new King James version, and when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, because remember, he told them, I need you to separate the people, set, situate them in groups of 50 and 100. Separate the people. They give the five loaves and the two fishes to Jesus. He takes them in his hand, the Bible says, and he prays. He gives thanks to the Father. He is thanking the Father for hearing and answering his prayer and his petition, the prayer of his heart. He takes what the disciples have provided him and then he begins to break it. And then he distributes it to the disciples who in turn distribute the food to the 12 to 15,000 people who are there the lessons of insufficiency. The first lesson I want you to understand is that what you have and what the disciples had, it was insufficient. But there is no insufficiency when you give what you have to Jesus. Now you're going to be thinking possibly, Pastor, we've read this story. We've heard this story. This is nothing earth shattering. Beloved, I believe if you let the Holy Spirit sear this in your heart and in your mind, it gives you a powerful lesson that there is no such thing as my insufficiency if I am willing and I surrender it to Jesus. When I bring whatever it is that he has entrusted me with and I give it to him, I place it in his hands. Also, when I think back on how he has led me, how he has delivered, how he has answered my prayers. That testimony, that Ebenezer, that rock of salvation, and that memory lets me know all things are possible to those who trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they had to give him what they had. One of the things I have been praying for, for our church family here at CCC, that the Lord will send us human resources or in the parlance of Jesus, pray that the Father will send you laborers. The Lord didn't say pray for more money. He didn't say pray for a bigger building or a larger building. He said the harvest is ripe. So therefore, when you pray, pray and ask the Lord to send laborers. Well, we need laborers. But in order to receive the laborers based upon Mark 6 and the lessons of insufficiency, we have to present the current laborers that we have now to the Lord. Just like the disciples presented the five loaves and the two fishes and gave them to Jesus and Jesus took them in his hands and he gave thanks to the father for them. So today, you know what I'm doing? On this Sabbath morning, I'm bringing to Jesus the Alexander and the Phillips family. I'm bringing the Finleys. I am bringing the Armstrongs. I'm bringing the Browns. I'm bringing Sister Miriam. I'm bringing the Williams. I'm bringing the Reynolds. I'm bringing the Wooldridges. I'm bringing the Jeffreys. I'm bringing the Lesters. I'm bringing the Wimbishes. I'm bringing the Banks. I'm bringing the Moraes. I'm bringing all of them. And if I didn't call your name, please don't get angry with me. I'm bringing all of the laborers that God has given us. I'm bringing the Insurrecos. I'm bringing Paula Weber. 
I, I, I'm bringing Myra and Harry. I'm bringing all of our members, Wes and the and Wes Spence. I'm bringing Lord, even members who had and, and Wes and Patsy. I, I'm bringing even our members who have relocated and moved away. I'm bringing the Pinkneys. I'm bringing the laborers. I'm bringing Valerie. I'm bringing all of our laborers and I am presenting you before Jesus. I'm giving you into his hands. Figuratively, figuratively, I can't speak this morning. I am doing that. I'm taking the church roster and I'm saying, Lord, and I'm calling out every single name that is on our church roster. Ethel and Kevin, who are in California, but supporting the ministry and the work here at CCC. I'm bringing all of us and I'm saying, Jesus, here are your workers. Here are your children. I'm giving them to you. So now I'm going to ask that you do with them, with us, exactly what you did with those five loaves and those two fishes so that we can understand the lessons of insufficiency. It only becomes insufficient if we don't present what we have to you. And when we do that, everything that is needed will be provided because I'm asking and praying in the name of Jesus. That it is done according to his will and for his purpose. Beloved, I want you to understand that I believe with all of my heart, there is no way God blessed CCC with this facility, 9121 Red Branch Road. Bought it, purchased it at the beginning of the pandemic in June of 2020. And within one week began or continued the food distribution ministry to the families that we are still serving. So we were able to do ministry out of the building that we had just bought within one week. And now it has been an interesting journey up to this point. And we're almost completed. And, and, the, and the work and the, and the effort is that it will be done very, very, very soon. I'm committed to seeing this through, but I want you to know the Lord didn't bring us to this point just for us to die on the vine. The law or the lessons of insufficiency, there is no insufficiency when we hate, when we take what we have and present it in the hands of our Lord and our Savior. That is not the end of the story, though. The people ate to their full. They ate until they needed or wanted no more. They were completely satisfied. God had nourished them spiritually. Now he had nourished them physically. But that is not the end. The Lord then tells the disciples, you need to go and collect up all of the remnants. And they collected 12 baskets of bread and fish. 12 baskets. I like to say that number 12 was symbolic of the 12 tribes, the 12 disciples, and the 12 gates to that new Jerusalem. Three gates on the east, three gates on the west, three gates on the north, and three gates on the south. 12 gates to the city of God. I want you to know that when you give exactly what you have and all that you have in the hands of Jesus, he will not only provide your very needs that you have right now immediately, but it is also a guarantee that if you are faithful and continue to trust in the master, you're going to walk through one of those 12 gates. Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. And while we have no idea, what no perfect idea of what the future holds, what we do know perfectly 
is that Jesus is walking with us. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The word of God declares, if he is for you, if the Lord is for you, who can be against you? The Lord has promised if you draw near to him, he will draw nigh unto you and Satan will flee from you. He trembles at the sound of the voice in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, friends of mine, my prayer today is that we will accept this wonderful message of salvation. That we will bring everything that we have and place it in his hands as he provides every single thing that we individually will need and collectively as a church family. He provides. So the watchword then is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. May God bless you today as we continue to trust him, as we continue to walk with him, as we continue to live for him as he lives in us. If that is your prayer today, then I invite you to bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you have extended to us this blessed hope of salvation. So therefore we entrust everything that we have and everything that we are into your hands, knowing that with you, there is no insufficiency, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you today. Our mission at CCCSDA is to share God's love with everyone, everywhere, every day. The ministries through which we carry out this mission are supported by the prayers and gifts of those whom God impresses to give. We encourage our members to continue your support through our online giving link. To our friends and guests, we invite you to use the PayPal or Cash App link on your screen to support the mission of CCCSDA as you have been blessed and led by the Lord. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for fellowshipping with us here at Columbia Community Center. May God be victorious in your life this week and we look forward to worshiping with you again next Sabbath.